item on the order paper is a motion on the draft BBC Charter and Framework Agreement. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The Minister will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes each. Clark, please read the motion. That this Assembly takes note of the content of the draft BBC Charter and Framework Agreement. Mr. Paul Given to move the motion. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move uh, that this Assembly takes note of the content of the draft BBC Charter and Framework Agreement. As Minister with responsibility for broadcasting matters in Northern Ireland, I am pleased to be here today to debate the draft BBC Charter and Framework Agreement. Uh, BBC Charter renewal is a very important issue for the broadcasting sector in Northern Ireland. People here attach a great value to having a comprehensive public service broadcasting service uh, which reflects all aspects of our social, cultural and political life. Uh, the Royal Charter is the constitutional basis for the BBC. It sets out its pu public uh, purposes, guarantees its independence and outlines the various duties placed upon it. The current Charter outlines the duties of the BBC Trust and the Executive Board. The proposed new Charter will come into effect on 1 January 2017. The BBC's Framework Agreement is an agreement between the UK Government and the BBC, and it sits alongside the Charter. It provides detail on many of the issues outlined in the Charter and also covers the BBC's funding and regulatory duties. The BBC Charter renewal is a very important issue for our broadcasting sector, and it is essential that the needs of Northern Ireland are catered for in the new Charter and Framework Agreement. I want to see opportunities in the TV and film industry being maximised for local workers and companies, and it is essential that we receive fair treatment in regard to public service broadcasting spend on commissioning, particularly in relation to spending on Irish language and Ulster Scots broadcasting. The BBC should meet its obligations within the Charter uh, to provide services for all of its communities, including Indigenous language broadcasting. It is also important that the portrayal of Northern Ireland on the networks shows a fuller picture of us as a modern society. It is also essential and increasingly so that the role diverse groups play within our society is reflected and that people are not portrayed by a single aspect of their identity, such as ethnicity or disability. The creative industries are important to our economy and the BBC is a major player in the creative industries ecosystem. As a result, it is essential that we have strengthened links and meaningful collaboration between the BBC and the wider creative industries. These essential changes, some of which that I've touched on earlier, include the following. There needs to be a full, authentic and accurate uh, and more up-to-date portrayal of Northern Ireland on the networks, which show the fuller picture of our society. We've been underserved by public uh, service broadcasting spend up to now, and we need, therefore, to see an increase and improvement in the commissioning of original programming showcasing our local communities. There also needs to be a more uh, local cultural TV and radio coverage, and opportunities for local workers and companies must be maximised. There needs to be greater emphasis placed on homegrown productions and the harnessing of local talent. There must be increased commissioning of original programming showcasing our local communities and what they have to offer. It is crucial that the BBC has governance, management and funding structures which reflect the needs of each devolved administration and region and better support the development, production and delivery of content from us, content that is available not just to our own audiences but also to wider audiences both within the United Kingdom and internationally. There should be a simple and transparent BBC strategy for Northern Ireland that is not only available for scrutiny by those responsible for governance, but is, also, uh, but is available as a roadmap and an empowering authority for the executives in the BBC and BBC NI. It is also essential that the Assembly has some means of, of holding the UK Government and the BBC to account to ensure that they provide for a truly representative service that is fit for purpose in the 21st century. Our Memorandum of Understanding gives in the Assembly a formal scrutiny role in regard to the BBC. Also, it provides for BBC officials appearing before Northern Ireland Assembly committees on matters relating to Northern Ireland on the same basis as it does in Westminster. These arrangements will be enshrined in the new Charter. This should provide a mechanism that makes the public service broadcaster accountable and answerable to this Assembly. 
Accountability should help ensure that we receive the economic and cultural value that we deserve and warrant from the BBC. In, their pa in the past, there was a failure to ensure that Northern Ireland received the cultural and economic value from BBC network production uh, that our population and devolved status demands. We need to be certain that won't happen again in the future. And the proposal set out in the draft charter will go a long way uh, towards ensuring that it won't. Provisions that are of particular interest to Northern Ireland include the following. Specific provision is made for the nations in the new licensing <coughs> regime. In addition, the new charter commits the BBC to continued support for the minority languages of the United Kingdom. In respect of accountability and governance, the BBC must reflect the constitutional arrangements within uh, the United Kingdom. All of the devolved administrations will be able to agree to the appointment to the new BBC board for their respective member before they are appointed. The BBC has committed to improving representation and portrayal of the nations and regions of the United Kingdom through its services. The nations and regions' public purpose will emphasise the need for the BBC to support the creative economies of each of the nations of the United Kingdom through the delivery of its mission and public purposes. The BBC must now report against the creative uh, remits uh, set out in the annual plan on a nation-by-nation -nation basis. The UK Government has recognised uh, that the BBC's impact and contribution to the creative economy, particularly in the nations, is an important one, and I welcome that recognition. In conclusion, at this stage, uh, let me say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the BBC Charter Review has given us in Northern Ireland a formal role in contributing fully to the review process. The current drafts mirror many of the demands of the devolved administrations, and my officials and I will continue in to engage uh, with DCMS uh, over the next number of weeks as we seek to ensure that our interests are clearly reflected in the final documents. Thank you. Here I'm, sir. Last Kaiherlach, Dan Kostya, Michelle Gildon. I call the Deputy uh, Chair of the Committee, please. Michelle Gildon. The committee received and noted copies of both the draft charter and the draft agreement that the House has been asked to take note of today. And the committee has been offered a briefing by the current BBC Trust member and will decide at our meeting on Thursday whether that is required on the foot of today's debate. Um, the future of the BBC has been much debated by the media over recent months, but I suspect that much of the detail of the debate has also only been of real concern to those in the media as well. It did seem to be the case at certain points in the Charter discussions a question of whether the BBC would survive at all as a public broadcaster, given what appeared to be ideological opposition to public sector broadcasting by the previous two Conservative Culture Secretaries, Saeed Javid and John Whittingdale. That argument has been settled, at least for the next 11 years, given that the Charter lasts until 2027. However, I might respectfully suggest that the details of the Charter and Draft Agreement are of little relevance to or interest to the ordinary person in the street. Of course, there are issues which do generate interest, such as the requirement to name people in the organisation who earn over 150,000, including the people who think of themselves as big stars. But in the overall scheme of things, that's not really that important. What is or should be important to us all in general is that we have the confidence that the BBC here is well governed and managed, that the licence fee is value for money and that the BBC maintains its independence from government. I think it is broadly accepted that the new arrangements go some way to embedding processes within the structures of the BBC that seek to achieve these objectives. As mentioned, a key issue for the BBC throughout the Charter discussions was certainty over funding. The renewal of the Charter is for a further 11 years and should provide stability for the organisation in terms of funding. So arguments over of the continuance of the licence fee have been put to bed and the BBC should be able to get on with its mandate of providing broadcasting to the public that will educate, inform and entertain. It is also important to note the change in governance arrangements with the establishment of a new board rather than the current system where we have trustees. The role of this board will be extensive, but it is important to highlight the requirement for transparency in the workings of the board and the independence from government of each member. 
that extent, it is to be noted that the Government is to directly appoint five of the 14 Strong Board, including a new chair, and the four national directors for the North of Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales. This leaves the BBC able to appoint four executive members of the board alongside another five independent members. And this should provide some assurance that the board is independent. The change to the regulation of the BBC is a fundamental one. Currently, the BBC self-regulates, but from next year, Ofcom will take on that responsibility and it will have extensive powers. Of course, particular interest are the powers of Ofcom to determine whether the BBC's commercial activities, given their link to public services, do not give an unfair competitive advantage to the BBC. An operating framework will be produced in which Ofcom will set requirements that will define what the relationship between the BBC and its commercial activities should be. And this will be crucially important given that the powers of Ofcom in relation to the BBC are extensive, including the power to order it to cease activity it judges to be anti-competitive. I think, in principle, most of us would support the idea of external independent regulation, but it will be important to see to what extent these new um, arrangements restrict the BBC's commercial activity. This will be important in the context of Section 13 of the Charter, which seeks to promote and establish creative partnerships with other organisations where they would be in the public interest. We have seen the growth of the creative industries here over a number of years, and according to the Department, 36,000 people, or 4.6% of the workforce, are employed in the creative industries or in creative occupations. We do not want to see the potential of the BBC to assist with that burgeoning industry curtailed by regulation. In addition, the National Audit Office will report on the group accounts. The Secretary of State must then lay the group accounts and the report of the Controller and Auditor General before Parliament, and these must be subsequently published by the BBC. Similarly, they have to be laid before our Assembly on the same day as, or as soon as possible after, it has been laid before Parliament in Westminster. This should afford transparency on the expenditure activities of the organisation. And then turn into the local as well as to the big ticket programmes. Would the member draw remarks to a close, okay. please? Um, the approved popular local programming is also important to people, whether that is stories about our communities, local sports programming, or locally produced series with wider appeals such as the fall. The committee have uh, got the, the offer. Okay, Gormila Mag, thank you. Okay. I call Jonathan Bell. I think, uh, or Deputy Speaker, that it's important to be because I understand that uh, while it's Stein as a take note debate, that the UK government will look at what comes from the Northern Ireland Assembly and from Scotland and Wales, and that will then be factored in uh, to the report uh, which the UK government uh, will present the Charter and the agreement to the Privy Council in time for it to come into force on the 1st of January 2017. So the points we can make today, albeit within five minutes, uh, should be the points that we ca want carried through. And indeed, the BBC has come a long way from the uh, British Broadcasting Company as it was in 1922. Now, I think it was the, I'll probably not get the pronunciation correct, the Earl of, of Crawford and Ballycar, who chaired the, the, the committee that led in 1926, looked at the United States and said, we don't want to see the uh, sort of unregulated broadcasting and produced a report uh, which was accepted and I think has been a very good thing and then the BBC became the British Broadcasting Corporation uh, deriving its authority uh, from Royal Charter. So we have now an opportunity to present the points that Northern Ireland wants to see uh, within the report and I do note with a lot of alarm that the BBC has developed production centres in England in Glasgow and in Cardiff, but none in uh, Northern Ireland. And I congratulate the former decal uh, committee uh, for the work that they did in terms of their legacy report on this, because it isn't acceptable that you have production centres in, English, in England, uh, in, in Cardiff and in Glasgow, but you don't have it in Northern Ireland. And I think if we did have a BBC production centre in Northern Ireland, it would give our licence fee payers a proper return for the investment that they have put in to the BBC. There's a lot we want to see the independence, we want to see the transparency. I know uh, Gregory Campbell, MP, formerly of this 
Parish will be delighted, particularly with one journalist. I suspect if they have to declare anything over £150,000 uh, in earnings. But I think it's really important for Northern Ireland that we take a strategic approach to supporting what are the creative industries here. We have seen so much over the years, not just with the BBC, but others, from Line of Duty right through to other productions outside the BBC in terms of Game of Thrones, where you've had some excellent productions, millions of pounds uh, brought into the economy as a result of uh, the creative industries. Now, what would it be like if, uh, and the demand we should place here through to the UK government is we want a production centre in Northern Ireland to allow us to take a strategic approach and, as I say, give the licence fee uh, payers some sort of return uh, for their money. I do like the fact that the BBC is going to be put on a proper financial footing that should enable them to plan properly for the future. Uh, I also like the changes that will take it uh, in terms of outside political cycles because I do believe uh, there is a role for the BBC to be independent into the future. Can I say one particular thing? I don't know whether it's myself uh, having a midlife crisis or just whatever age I'm getting to. I'm listening to more radio uh, than I am on podcasts uh, than I am of television. And I understand that Northern Ireland's listenership to BBC Radio is much higher than any other part uh, of the United Kingdom. So there is a strong argument uh, for radio services uh, to be more appreciated uh, by the BBC, given that that is there. And there is some excellent radio uh, from BBC4 uh, podcasts uh, that I enjoy, written conspiracy thriller, thrillers from Matthew Brighton down. Wonderful creative radio and news. And I think we should recognise, particularly in Northern Ireland, where we have an ageing demographic, that they, a lot of older people look to their radios as a form of company. It's their choice uh, of what they're listening to in media. And given that there's that higher listenership in Northern Ireland to radio, I think we should have that increased investment in radio. So both radio, but for me critically, a proper production centre in Northern Ireland from the BBC to let us, we've already shown that we can outperform in the creative industries. I think it would be an asset for the BBC, it would be an asset for us, and it would be an asset back to the licensed pair. I call Andy Allen. Opening, if I may, um, on behalf of the Austrian News Party, pay our condolences to the renowned BBC NI broadcaster and journalist Paddy O'Flaherty. Um, our, our sympathies are with his family at this time. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the BBC Charter Review is both timely and necessary. The BBC itself, a national institution, which contributes greatly to the cultural life of the United Kingdom, and on the whole, it enjoys a great deal of public support. In return for the licence fee, the audience rightly expects the BBC to continue to produce high quality, creative and innovative content. In my party's response to the BBC Charter Review, we recognised this was and is a time of change for the UK, not least in terms of how devolution is impacting on Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The BBC needs to adapt to these changes and ensure at the same time the interests of the nations and regions have a voice. One of the most important changes which the news and current affairs departments in BBC Northern Ireland has to adapt to is to recognise the existence of an official opposition at Stormont and to balance it report, its reporting accordingly. In fairness, the BBC does not have an easy job, given that it has to try to cater for an extremely wide range of age groups, ethnicities and communities, including, of course, those in the devolved nations and the UK regions, where audiences, audiences need an and, and expectations can and often do very widely. Quite correctly, all feel that they have a stake in the BBC and all should be reflected in what the BBC does. We are well aware of the debate over how well the BBC service licence pairs in the devolved regions. Regional opt-outs ensure local news and programming fit within the BBC nationally and it is extremely important that the people of Northern Ireland have access to a respected national broadcaster. We note that in Schedule 2, Paragraph 6, Ofcom have a great deal of discretion. It states that Ofcom must impose on the BBC the requirements they consider appropriate, having regard to the needs of the nations and regions. Many of the following clauses begin with the phrases, what appears to Ofcom are such provisions as Ofcom consider appropriate. These 
This theme is continued in Schedule 2, Paragraph 7, Programme Making in the Nations and Regions. Here it states the Ofcom must impose on the BBC the requirements they consider appropriate for securing what appears to Ofcom to be a suitable proportion of all the network programmes made in the UK, or programmes made in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Again, the phrase, what appears to Ofcom, keeps cropping up, and these ro the role of Ofcom is one which is obviously key in ensuring the nations and regions receive fair and equitable treatment. The Ulster Unionist Party greatly value the importance of locally produced and commissioned programming, but it must be high, high quality. There is no doubt that the creative industries have been a real Northern Ireland success story in recent times. And the BBC has a major role to play in commissioning programmes and working with external producers in making programmes. This is an area where we feel the BBC can make a real positive impact on Northern Ireland, PLC, and help the local economy in the process. I will now return to the issue of BBC funding. The BBC faces challenges that were unforeseen even 20 years ago. The success and popularity of Sky TV and the growth of digital media platforms have provided a very different operating environment to the, the days when the only competition came from ITV and independent radio. It is crucial that BBC have a stable funding framework in order to enable forward planning. The 2006 Charter will extend for a further 10 years until the end of 2027, and the 2006 Agreement will be revoked and replaced by a new framework agreement. This is a time, this is a time frame which should provide sufficient security and stability for the BBC going forward. The Ulster Unionist Party recognises the key role which the BBC plays at both UK-wide and local level. We want to see a BBC that is fit for purpose and which meets the needs of the people of Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom as we progress into the 21st century. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, certainly, uh, I fervently believe in the importance of having a reliant public broadcaster that acts in the public interest, serving all audiences through the provision of impartial, high quality and distinctive output, and services which inform, educate and entertain. You'll find no disagreement here, Mr Deputy Speaker, in this objective of the BBC's mission in its Royal Charter. But the real test is in how these objectives are put into practice. I don't intend to go through uh, the Charter comprehensively. I know other members will point out uh, issues of importance to them, but there are just a few things that I would like to touch upon. The SDLP certainly welcomes the Out of London quotas. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, that must extend beyond the outer suburbs of London. It must reflect um, the cultural, right, I'm social... I'm picking up a number of conversations around the place. Perhaps members uh, could, if they wish to conduct conversation, conduct them elsewhere, or less audibly at least. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, yes, but we are very clear that the out-of-London quotas must extend beyond the... Um, Outer Hebrides and include the distinctiveness, the social, the cultural um, distinctiveness of Northern Ireland. And within that, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, if you look at Derry and Belfast, for example, within the north, there are clear cultural and social uh, distinctions there, which must be protected and reflected through local services, like Radio Foil, for example. The SDLP also welcomes the extension to this assembly of parity with Scotland and Wales in relation to the appointments of nation members to the new unitary board. This is an accountability step that has certainly been long overdue. A number of members have also touched on the issue of salaries. Yes, of course. To the member for, taking, uh, for giving way. Member be aware this is an issue that I raised in the Communities Committee about public appointments. Um, there is, I suspect, in Northern Ireland a, a coterie of about 100 people who absolutely dominate all public appointments. Uh, does she agree with me that it's essential that if the BBC is going to be truly a, a national broadcaster, it has to be reflective of the public, and that includes uh, not just uh, the sort of usual definitions that are used, but also issues like social class? Um, I, thank the member, I, I thank the member for his intervention. I firmly believe that all appointments should be done in an open and transparent manner, whether that's for a spin doctor or whether it's for appointments to the new unitary board. So, in terms of salaries, in terms of salaries, yes, a number of members ha have passed comment, and I think that it's only right, and we welcome the move to greater openness and transparency in terms of the salaries of the BBC's highest earners. Uh, the public have a right to know how public money is spent, uh, and I believe that it is as simple as that. 
What we would do, Mr Deputy Speaker, is just to air a, a note of caution. Um, the SDLP would be strongly against any suggestion of a move to introduce subscription charges for the BBC because we do not want to see a first and second class system where people can only access their public service broadcaster based on their ability to pay. But we do welcome, however, the move to open up the tendering process. We think this is a positive move if approached correctly. Certainly, it improves the opportunities for us here in Northern Ireland to build on its success in producing world-class TV productions, not least uh, the Game of Thrones. And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, my party colleague in Westminster, uh, Margaret Ritchie MP, has already sought assurances from the Secretary of State that the collaboration between the BBC and RTE, which is a much valued one, will not be undermined. And I think it's very important that I take this opportunity to reiterate that point. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Naomi Long. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on behalf of Alliance about the BBC Charter and Framework Agreement announced in Parliament on the 16th of September. The Charter is an essential instrument for an organisation which has become a cornerstone of broadcasting in the UK and also throughout the rest of the world. It is uniquely well respected as an institution, and whilst it is not without flaws, I believe it has an important role to fulfil as a public broadcaster. I want to focus my comments on three aspects of the draft charter and the particular opportunities and challenges they present to the BBC and Northern Ireland. Firstly, I am concerned, unlike some others, that with this particular charter review we are witnessing further erosion of the BBC, but by means of stealth. The current government appears to want the BBC to be both public service broadcaster and at the same time commercially competitive, and in doing so places challenges in its way on both fronts. As has well been documented in the media, the Charter will lead to the publication of the salaries of presenters and talent on the BBC. The argument is strong that this accounts for public money being expended. However, it could lead to the release of information which would be considered commercially sensitive by its competitors and could make the poaching of household names from the BBC to other channels much simpler. Whilst that may not seem much of an issue, it disregards the investment in talent which, and development which the BBC makes and the negative impact that it could have on viewing figures and popularity of its shows, for which the same people will no doubt also judge it very harshly in terms of performance. It seems the government lives up to the adage of knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing. The same pattern of commercialisation has led to the outsourcing of much BBC programming to independent production companies. Again, not of itself a bad thing. It results in programmes which, which only a public service broadcaster could afford um, to risk making. Once they gain popular appeal, then being sold off to the highest bidder, again diminishing the BBC's schedule despite their investment in developing those programmes. A recent example of that is the Great British Bake Off. Who would have thought a show about competitive baking would grip the nation, but it has. However, it took a public service broadcaster to broadcast it on BBC Two before it was able to be mainstreamed onto primetime television um, on BBC One, and they have now lost out to a commercial operator. While some argue that that will allow new talent and opportunities to break through, it does also hit viewing figures on the BBC, which it is judged against for performance. Additionally, it has been announced the BBC will be funding free television licences for the over 75s in this charter. I welcome this move and indeed I believe it could go much further. However, it will come at the expense of the BBC's running costs, its staff and programme content, rather than through any additional funding, further undermining its competitiveness. Mr Speaker, for both these reasons, I fear the intentions of the current government are perhaps not as honourable as they claim. My second concern is the independence of the BBC with inclusion of political appointees on the board. As a public service broadcaster, it must be seen to be independent, and it is hugely important that that is maintained. Political appointments have the potential to diminish that um, significantly. And given the various questions raised around public appointments in Northern Ireland, I am grateful that there will be a degree of transparency and openness around this, because it should not be politicised. The appointment of someone from Northern Ireland to the board does, however, represent opportunities to increase Northern Irish created content. Local content made in Northern Ireland for Northern Ireland is hugely important. However, if we're going to develop our creative industries, it's also important that the BBC commit to making national content in each of the constituent countries. Mr Speaker, we have demonstrated in Northern Ireland through television shows such as The Fall, Game of Thrones um, and the programme Lily's Driftwood Bay that Northern Ireland can create and produce world-class television. I want to see this built on through the BBC's local content commitment. 
Finally, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, an opportunity that has been lost is one to decriminalise the non-payment of a TV licence. It's one that my party leader, David Ford, raised with the Home Office during his time as Justice Minister and which could have been addressed in this Charter. Just last year, a quarter of criminal prosecutions in Northern Ireland were for failure to pay the TV licence and less than half were found guilty. This puts significant pressure on the legal system and decriminalisation would allow cost savings um, and non-payments to be pursued through non-criminal means. So accordingly, I note the BBC Charter Review and hope that the opportunities for improvement within the Charter are fully realised, whilst the risks to what is an excellent public service broadcaster and its independence are minimised. Thank you. I call Christopher Stolford. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the BBC is one of the great national institutions. It is extremely powerful. It's much more powerful, I would suggest, than any political party almost, in, uh, certainly in Northern Ireland um, and potentially in the United Kingdom as a whole. With such power comes a responsibility for regulation. And therefore, I welcome the fact that Ofcom are to assume regulatory powers in regard to the BBC. I think it's right that an organisation for which um, millions of people are taxed to pay for should be regulated in this way and should be scrutinised uh, for uh, the way in which it is run. I welcome the fact that there will be, as uh, the member for East Belfast, Naomi Long, said, I welcome the fact that there will be a, a Northern Ireland representative appointed uh, to make our voice heard. And uh, given the comments from the former special adviser turned assembly member for North Belfast, I'm sure she'll be able to advise in terms of the public appointment procedures that she went through uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to appointing people. I am, I am delighted uh, that uh, progress has been made pro by royal appointment. Progress has been made uh, in terms of openness and transparency. The headlines have obviously been grabbed uh, around the issue of. Uh, talent uh, pay and what they're being paid. But I, actually, I think a, a more uh, important issue is uh, the importance that the coverage that's produced uh, for Northern Ireland uh, reflects uh, Northern Ireland. And the BBC recognises this. It recognises that it has an obligation to uh, minority languages uh, and uh, cultural expression. And I think one of the areas where I do believe there has been a falling away uh, has been in terms of the representation of the uh, entire Ulster Scots uh, tradition. Uh, I am not an Ulster Scot in the sense of family background, but it's something that interests me uh, and something that I have uh, taken an interest in because the shared heritage and tradition that there is. I mean, Northern Ireland and Scotland are literally divided by about eight miles of water at some points and precious little else. And so uh, it's part of who we are, it's part of our tradition, it's part of our identity. And I would like to see more reflection of that uh, being produced by the BBC. Um, I absolutely am not saying that you know, the growth of one should be at the expense of another in terms of Irish language, because I recognise that that's important to people as well. Uh, but I think what we should have is a greater parity between those two traditions and how they are reflected. I think some of the programmes that have been produced uh, have been really, really good, particularly I think of the, uh, the programme about the, the Ulster Scots contribution in Canada, the series that was produced there. And I would like to see more high quality programming like that uh, being produced uh, for, um, as part of uh, the, the obligations that the BBC have um, in that regard. BBC likes to talk about the unique way in which it is funded. Um, that's code for the, the TV tax uh, that we all pay. Um, I agree, actually, with the point that's been made again um, by the, the member for East Belfast with regard to the need to decriminalise um, non-payment of a licence fee. Um, it cannot be right that so much time and effort and resource is spent pursuing people uh, at criminal charges against people uh, for the non-payment of a TV licence. Moving forward, I think more openness, more transparency as to how money is spent. 
a greater uh, preparedness to reflect the society uh, that it serves, and a genuine commitment to independence and uh, neutrality. Um, the BBC is, as I said, a great national institution. They cover events like the uh, big national events, the Queen's Jubilee, the state opening of Parliament, even the general election coverage uh, is uh, better than that uh, offered by anyone else. It's in all of our interests that it continues to be a success, but it's also in our interests that it's held accountable for the way in which taxpayer money is draws remarks to a close, please. And the way in which taxpayer money is spent. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Iram Sir Carl Nicolan. I call Carl Nicolan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to declare an interest at the start of this as one of the ministers, the other ones over there, um, who probably started the process around the Charter and Font Agreement around the BBC uh, review. Um, I mean, I'm personally delighted to see that some of the suggestions that were brought forward have been taken on board, but I, do, I still think, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we're, our committee is going to meet on Thursday, that there's uh, there, there's still some concerns around um, some of the issues. For example, um, I mean, the the whole issue around the independence of the BBC, I think, is just a given. However, one of the things, particularly as a result of the Smith and Silk or Silk and Smith Commission and the funding arrangements, particularly around Scotland, in the memorandum of understanding that was uh, brought forward then, it meant to say that ourselves here and certainly Wales felt that, you know, in that case, there was uh, an inequality there. Um, and uh, so that seems to have changed, and certainly the fact. One of the concerns I had about any body regulating itself, so Ofcom have now become the regulating body, and even the advisory committee and the arrangements around it um, have been listened to as well. Uh, I mean, you know, in one year, I think it was something along the figure of almost four billion pounds that the BBC had accrued, uh, and you know, a lot of us would like to know how that money was spent. And one of the issues I had, and I uh, listened to Jonathan Bell talking about the BBC needing to have almost a production house here, uh, I would actually tend to disagree with him because I think one of the arguments that we have made successfully is that we have excellent producers and commissioners and the ability to commission programmes here. And in order for our independent creative sector, creative industries to thrive, we need to try and support that. The BBC haven't exploited that skills and expertise that we have here uh, as much as it should have, in my opinion. I also believe that without the broadcasting funds, the BBC within itself have not contributed enough to Ulster Scots and certainly to the Irish language. Uh, the broadcast funds, while they're administ administered through BBC um, and even through the, the work of the NI screen, um, still, for me, raises concerns. I'm still you know, not convinced this argument around parity of those broadcast funds stands up, to be frank. I do share some of the concerns and have shared some of the concerns, and that will be reflected somewhat in the Charter, about making sure, and the Minister touched upon this in his opening remarks, that in terms of making sure that we are represented in a way that is true and reflect, reflect, reflective and faithful to people here is really, really important. And I believe the BBC have lacked in that in the past. And one of the best ways that we can uh, change that is to spend more, more money here commissioning programmes. Indeed, we've made excellent programmes that can be shown anywhere. And, and I, I believe it's a two-way process. There hasn't been enough done, despite the fact that the creative industry sector here and the NI Screen and indeed with the BBC here have went and lobbied and argued for that. And the context for all that argument was particularly around the charter renewal and indeed the funding agreement. I don't think it's challenging the independence of the BBC to ask where the money is being spent and, more importantly, how it's being spent. I would definitely like to see uh, more of a breakdown in terms of local commissioning here, and particularly more commissioning in addition to the broadcast funds around the Irish language and the Ulster Scots. I did share some of the concerns around some of the workings of some of those programmes, particularly in relation to the Ulster Scots. Um, but again, I mean, that's, that's by the by. That's, that's something that we need to certainly look at. 
For us, I think it's really, really important that we need to look at governance and lessons learned around the failure around some of the governance issues the BBC in the past. I mean, one of the biggest issues certainly would be the governance around some of the historical uh, sexual abuse allegations. I think the BBC were disgraceful, quite disgraceful in the way that they governed. They looked after the celebrity rather than the, 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 the victims. And I think, if anything, this presents us with an opportunity that should never happen again. Quite looking forward to hearing what some of the big presenters are. I think we could maybe, you know, take a guess on that. So this is a take note debate. Yes, by, by me, Craig Nahe, and Ish. I'm delighted to take part in this, delighted that we've got it thus far. But there's still much more work that we need to do. I call Nelson McCausland. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And uh, the BBC, as the principal public service broadcaster for the United Kingdom, has a special place in the life of the nation. It has a role in representing Northern Ireland to the wider United Kingdom audience through its programming, and also in the other direction, in representing the diversity and the unity of the United Kingdom to Northern Ireland viewers. It is, of course, the British Broadcasting Corporation. It's important also that it has uh, a role uh, as regards preventing the marginalization of Northern Ireland and indeed the other nations and regions, and avoiding what has in some cases been identified there as a rather a London-centric approach, particularly in regard to commissioning, where I think Northern Ireland has not been adequately represented um, in terms of commissioning at a United Kingdom level. There's also the important issue as regards providing employment in Northern Ireland and supporting the cultural sector whether that be in-house productions or the work of independent producers. And we want to see, I think, going forward, a better and greater focus on Northern Ireland, and especially in terms of equitable capital investment. Other regions of the United Kingdom got major capital investment. Northern Ireland was overlooked. And in that regard, could I say there are some excellent locations in the heart of Belfast, close to the University of Ulster and on the north side of the city centre. I'm glad that I have the endorsement there of the alert member, at least one of the other members of North Belfast. One of the issues that was touched on there, and it was touched on by several people, was in regards to reflecting cultural traditions and diversity within Northern Ireland. And there has to be a commitment there, because education and broadcasting, the school system and the broadcasting system, are hugely important in affirming, sustaining, and supporting local cultural traditions. That is why the Irish language lobby has made such an emphasis on uh, Irish medium schools and in ensuring also that there is a substantial provision for the Irish language in terms of BBC uh, broadcasting. So there is an important role there for broadcasting in affirming, sustaining and supporting cultural traditions. But it's important that that is done in a way that is fair and equitable. And Karen Bradley MP, the Secretary of State for uh, Culture, Media and Sport, in a letter that was circulated, made particular reference to minority languages, in our case, Irish language, also Scots language, and culture and cultural broadcasting. Because that is not simply an issue of the BBC. That is an equality issue for Northern Ireland. And it is also a human rights issue. Now, I noticed that the uh, former um, decal minister has now left us. Uh, commented on uh, her view that there was not a strong case for parity between the two broadcasting funds. That simply doesn't stack up. Because if you look at the evidence, and I pressed her on this point once about how you would measure and how you would justify spend and measure need. And one of the things that she mentioned was viewing figures. Well, if you actually look at the viewing figures for programs that are supported by the Irish Language Broadcast Fund, and then you look at viewing figures for programs that are supported by the Ulster Scots Broadcast Fund. The viewing figures for the Ulster Scots Broadcast Fund and supported programs, those viewing figures are actually in most cases higher than those for the Irish Language Broadcast Fund. The one exception I have to confess for the Irish Language Broadcast Fund is the program where Daniel O'Donnell and his country music show goes to Newry. I'm sure that will have strong support from Mr. Kennedy and folks in that particular area. But I suspect, I suspect, and I could be wrong in this, I suspect, no, no, well, okay, yes. 
grateful to the member for giving way, and of course any mention of Newry is very worthwhile. And, uh, and let me also say it might be interesting to, to study the viewing figures of Stormont today for insomniacs and burglars. Well, I haven't seen members the next viewing figures for that, but could I suggest to the members today that the viewing figures, which are exceptional for, for Daniel O'Donnell and his country music show, are probably more a reflection of the fan base of Daniel O'Donnell than they are a, support, a measure of support and interest in the Irish language, but I leave that to others to work on. What I would say is that in Northern Ireland, the current approach by the BBC has been inequitable and unfair, with preferential treatment and provision for Irish culture, both as regards the BBC's own core budget, where there is an in-house, or there has been an in-house Irish language unit, something that was never replicated, both as regards its own core budget, and then the mention was made of the broadcast funds. There is a huge disparity between those two funds, and sadly, the previous culture minister did not fight the corner there for equity and parity. Now, her party has a message. They often put it up, a slogan, an Ireland or an island of equals. But when it came to the broadcasting funds, some were more equal than others. And certainly, it was her cultural tradition that she was fighting for rather than any other. So in that regard, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I would emphasize going forward the need for the BBC with its own budget and the two broadcast funds to ensure that there is an opportunity there for That's fairness, the equity and equality close, and that cultural rights are delivered to us all. Thank you. Okay, I call Eamon McCann. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. I think it's fair to say that uh, there are no two British institutions more widely admired around the world than the BBC and the National Health Service. They have also got this in common, that both these institutions have been for some time and continue to be under relentless assault from people and interests who believe that the free market should be allowed to rip through every aspect of our lives. That aspect of what's happening to the BBC is represented in the Charter, and I regret the fact that it hasn't been mentioned by uh, any, speaker, any speaker since uh, uh, so, uh, so far. If you look at the Charter document, you will see that it refers to the necessity of the BBC in the future to be aware of what it calls the wider media market, the key word there being market. And the rest of the Charter, if you look through it and comb out the phrases, you will see what is intended. The direction of travel of the BBC, which the government in London and commercial interests, most ferociously the Murdoch Empire, where they want to force the BBC to go. When I do scheduling, this is what the Charter says, that the BBC must take into account any potential adverse impact on fair and effective competition. What does that mean? It means that when deciding what to broadcast and when to broadcast it and on what channel to broadcast it, the BBC must take into account the effect that this might have on ITV or Sky or other providers. In other words, it's saying that the BBC must step into the commercial market, otherwise it will not be meeting, according to the Charter, meeting its legal responsibilities. I regard that as a very ominous aspect uh, uh, of this uh, a, a Charter. I think that there's very little in the Charter. Well, there's much that I would welcome in it, but I'm drawing attention to the things which concern me, which I believe ought to concern uh, this House. Uh, the, there's very little in it which would safeguard the BBC's independence in funding or in governance. As Gilder New has already mentioned the fact that the government will appoint the new chair of the unitary board, a very powerful position, and that chair, a government appointee, will then appoint not four, as he said, but five other non-executive directors. This means that the government of the day will be in a powerful position to influence on how the BBC is run, what values it expresses, and all the rest of it. I think that's regrettable, and I think we all should express our uh, regret about it. The, the, uh, 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 the government has shown no willingness to respect the BBC's independence. Let me give you one example from the recent past. The government decided that the BBC should fund license, free licenses for the over 75s. What was the rationale for that? Why now did they do that? They spelt it out. They were quite open about it. It was part of welfare reform. That's what was said at Westminster. We'll hit the BBC for millions as part of welfare reform. 
That's an absolutely disgraceful way to treat an institution like the BBC. We in the North have a lot to thank the BBC for. I come from Derry, where Radio Foil sort of has got phenomenal sort of uh, listenership figures for the size uh, a, of its area. It is a tremendously important for the cultural life sort of, of Derry, just as Radio Ulster is for the whole a, of the North. I would say I've got a particular interest in popular culture and popular music. I would say sort of, that the BBC in Derry, Stephen Macaulay's electric mainline program in Belfast, the, uh, uh, a, a, what's it called, sort of, uh, across the line, sort of, with Stuart Bailey and people. There would not be the wonderful efflorescence of youthful talent in the area of popular culture had the BBC not given an audience to many of the young bands which are coming forward when it made no commercial sense for them to do it. No commercial sense at all for Stephen Macaulay to be playing the local music of bands. Yet some of them have gone on to great things, and even those which haven't gone on to great things have actually provided an uplift and a, a sort of an area of imagination to thousands of people which they otherwise would not have had. I'm not a starry-eyed, uncritical admirer of the BBC, not by any means, but I believe that it is a precious asset for our society which should be defended and it shouldn't be left simply to BBC employees like the journalists organised in the NUJ to defend its independence. Assemblies like this should step forward and defend the BBC and I urge us all to do so because it is under threat. I call on the Minister for Communities, Mr Paul Given, to wind on the debate on the motion and just to emphasise the Minister there's ten minutes for this. I will not need the 10 minutes, Deputy Speaker, but thank you for the offer. Um, uh, can I say it has been an interesting uh, debate that we have had, and, and members have raised a number of uh, important issues, uh, and I have no doubt they will be reflected upon uh, as well um, by Westminster ultimately when this is being uh, debated there, because it is a UK wide uh, issue. Uh, but we have had an opportunity this time, unlike before. Uh, to be able to feed into the process, to influence, uh, and I think when you look at the Charter you can see real tangible evidence of the value that that uh, input has had, uh, and I want to commend my officials who have been engaging on this issue uh, with DCMS uh, and with counterparts uh, in Scotland and Wales. Uh, and we have been able to put forward a case, I believe, for the devolved regions within uh, the United Kingdom, which is being uh, reflected. Uh, in the Charter and the Framework Agreement, and we will see uh, tangible benefits flowing from that. A couple of comments picked up by some members I thought were, were noteworthy. Um, I was impressed with Andy Allen's uh, effort to indicate that uh, the Charter and the, the Framework should have more of a focus on ensuring that the opposition gets better uh, uh, representation. L let me say I would be delighted to have ever more uh, publication and coverage of how the opposition performs in Stormont to the masses. Uh, I, I think that uh, that, that would do them uh, probably no good at all, but I would be quite happy to put forward such an argument. I'll give way. The Minister for giving way. Uh, the Minister will note that throughout the course of today's business uh, it had to be presented to us uh, not by uh, the Leader of the Opposition, but actually a member of the Government, the Deputy Chair of the Committee. And, uh, the first so-called Opposition Day that we had in this House, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, or Mike Nesbitt's Deputy, or whatever his official title is, couldn't be here yesterday either. Thank the Member for that comment. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it hanging there. Um, but obviously, members have raised a number of points. Um, let me say that I do think that we are very well served here in Northern Ireland uh, by the BBC in the round. I, I, I'll point out a couple of areas where I think that they could do a lot better in representing Northern Ireland uh, more accurately. But in the round, it, it is an institution uh, that should be defended. Uh, Mr McCann highlighted it uh, in terms of two of the finest British institutions. Uh, the BBC is up there. And when we consider um, coverage of uh, the radio programmes that were highlighted by Eamon McCann. Um, I, I prefer Hugo Duncan over other programmes in the morning. Um, I, I have to say, since I've taken up this post, I, I listen even less to the news outputs now on the BBC than ever before. Uh, and I, uh, but Hugo Duncan, I find, pr presents good value for money and is worth paying the licence fee for just for that slot. Um, when you think of how local sport is covered, um, the coverage that you have of Ulster Rugby. 
You think of the coverage that you have of the Northwest 200, the Ulster Grand Prix, uh, in terms of motorbikes. It's fantastic. And you, the, the audience that you get when that's being streamed as well, right across the globe. And so I think in our local sport, uh, we are being very well served. But do I believe the BBC could do more? Yes, I do. In reflecting our culture, you take, for example, Scarva and the, the parade that takes place by the Royal Brack Preceptor, right? And the tens of thousands of people that take part in a demonstration of our heritage, culture, uh, and a demonstration of the arts. What coverage does the BBC give to that event? Very little, if at all. And I think that that is something that the BBC need to address. I think in its news output, and obviously it's independent in terms of editorial decisions, but the BBC is an incredibly pro-European organisation, which was reflected in its coverage throughout the referendum campaign. I think of its coverage of social issues across the United Kingdom, and again it pursues an incredibly left-wing liberal agenda. And when I look, when I look at when, when I look at even the commentators that dominate on the BBC, I struggle to, sit, to listen to where the commentators, so-called that are brought on as independent, that ever represent a more socially conservative point of view, which prevails in Northern Ireland. When I listen to its programme, so I think the BBC could do more to accurately reflect Northern Ireland, and this will be an opportunity now because the Assembly will be able to uh, uh, hold to account the BBC and pull people in and ask them how are they representing Northern Ireland. And there are two areas where I think the BBC uh, can do more. The BBC does, of course, uh, have to represent the values of the United Kingdom uh, right across the world, and those values of fairness uh, are fundamentally important. And I think the BBC do do that well. Um, and whenever I look uh, at the BBC in terms of its Royal Charter. I think that's to its credit uh, that it was recognised in such a way. And it is unique uh, in terms of the way in which its incorporation is found. And ju just as an aside, when I was reading the Royal Charter, um, I think the, the language that's used in that opening page for members that want to read it is a, an excellent demonstration of the English language. Elizabeth II by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of our other realms and territories, Queen, head of the Commonwealth, defender of the faith. Yeah. And you go on and you read uh, in terms of the language that is used. Uh, whenever it got to highlighting the role of the, the minister uh, at Westminster, this is, a, this is a title that I, I would love to see an, a, an incorporation of a body in Northern Ireland where I could have this title. But it reads then, to us, by our right and trusty and well-beloved councillor, Karen Ann Bradley, our principal secretary of state for culture, media and sport. It's a fantastic demonstration of, the, of how the ling English language can be presented in such a, a fabulous way. And I would encourage members to read all of that. Uh, if time permitted, I would love to read it out into the record. But I think it's a tremendous uh, recognition of the BBC as the British Broadcasting Corporation, something in Northern Ireland that the BBC should be very proud of. But obviously, this is going to have a positive impact in terms of the content of the Charter. Northern Ireland, I believe, over the next 11 years, will now get a more equitable deal uh, from the BBC. And the BBC has set down in these documents that it accepts that it has a clear obligation to provide services for all of its audience and to represent and reflect its nations, regions, and communities. In addition, going forward under the new arrangements, this Assembly will now have the ability to hold the BBC to account where it falls short on that delivery. So I commend uh, the draft BBC Charter and Framework Agreement, Mr Speaker, and ask the Assembly to support the motion. Okay, the question now is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it.